Chapter 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lectures of Colonel Robert Green Ingersoll, Volume 2 Ingersoll's Lecture on Liberty of Man, Woman, and Child Ladies and Gentlemen, in my judgment, slavery is the child of ignorance. Liberty is born of intelligence. Only a few years ago there was a great awakening in the human mind. Men began to inquire, By what right does a crowned robber make me work for him? The man who asked this question was called a traitor. Others said, By what right does a robed priest rob me? That man was called an infidel, and whenever he asked a question of that kind, the clergy protested. When they found that the earth was round, the clergy protested. When they found that the stars were not made out of the scraps that were left over on the sixth day of creation, but were really great shining wheeling worlds, the clergy protested, and said, When is this spirit of investigation to stop? They said then, and they say now, that it is dangerous for the mind of man to be free. I deny it. Out on the intellectual sea there is room for every sail. In the intellectual air there is space enough for every wing and the man who does not do his own thinking is a slave, and does not do his duty to his fellow men. For one, I expect to do my own thinking, and I will take my own oath this minute that I will express what thoughts I have honestly and sincerely. I am the slave of no man, and of no organization. I stand under the blue sky and the stars, under the infinite flag of nature, the peer of every human being. Standing as I do in the presence of the unknown, I have the same right to guess as though I have been through five theological seminaries. I have as much interest in the great absorbing questions of origin and destiny as though I had D.D. L.L.D. at the end of my name. All I claim, all I plead, is simple liberty of thought, that is all. I do not pretend to tell what is true, and all the truth. I do not claim that I have floated level with the heights of thought, or that I have descended to the depths of things. I simply claim that what idea I have, I have a right to express, and any man that denies it to me is an intellectual thief and robber. That is all. I say, take those chains off from the human soul. I say, break these orthodox fetters, and if there are wings to the spirit, let them be spread. That is all I say. And I ask you if I have not the same right to think that any other human has. If I have no right to think, why have I such a thing as a thinker? Why have I a brain? And if I have no right to think, who has? If I have lost my right, Mr. Smith, where do you find yours? If I have no right, have three or four men, or three hundred or four hundred, who get together and sign a card and build a house and put a steeple on it with a bell in it, have they any more right to think than they had before? That is the question, and I am sick of the whip and lash in the region of mind and intellect, and I say to these men, let us alone. Do your own thinking, express your own thoughts. And I want to say tonight that I claim no right that I am not willing to give to every other human being beneath the stars, none whatever. And I will fight tonight for the right of those who disagree with me to express their thoughts just as soon as I will fight for my own right to express mine. In the good old times our fathers had an idea that they could make people believe to suit them. 
our ancestors in the ages that are gone really believed that by force you could convince a man you cannot change the conclusion of the brain by force but i will tell you what you can do by force and what you have done by force you can make hypocrites by the million you can make a man say that he has changed his mind but he remains of the same opinion still put fetters all over him crush his feet in iron boots lash him to the stock burn him if you please but his ashes are of the same opinion still i say our fathers in the good old times and the best thing i can say about them is they are dead they had an idea they could force men to think their way and do you know that idea is still prevalent even in this country do you know they think they can make a man think their way if they say we will not trade with that man we won't vote for that man we won't hire him if he is a lawyer we will die before we take his medicine if he is a doctor we won't invite him we will socially ostracize him he must come to our church he must think our way or he is not a gentleman there is much of that even in this blessed country not excepting the city of albany itself now in the old times of which i have spoken they said we can make all men think alike all the mechanical ingenuity of this earth cannot make two clocks run alike and how are you going to make millions of people of different quantities and qualities and amount of brain clad in this living robe of passionate flesh how are you going to make millions of them think alike if the infinite god if there is one who made us wished us to think alike why did he give a spoonful of brains to one man and a bushel to another why is it that we have all degrees of humanity from the idiot to the genius if it was intended that all should think alike i say our fathers concluded they would do this by force and i used to read in books how they persecuted mankind and do you know i never appreciated it i did not i read it but it did not burn itself as it were into my very soul what infamies had been committed in the name of religion and i never fully appreciated it until a little while ago i saw the iron arguments our fathers used to use i tell you the reason we are through that is because we have better brains than our fathers had since that day we have become intellectually developed and there is more real brain and real good sense in the world today than in any other period of its history and that is the reason we have more liberty that is the reason we have more kindness but i say i saw these iron arguments our fathers used to use i saw here the thumb screw two little innocent looking pieces of iron armed on the inner surface with protuberances to prevent their slipping and when some man denied the efficacy of baptism or maybe said i do not believe that the whale ever swallowed a man to keep him from drowning then they put these pieces of iron upon his thumb and there was a screw at each end and then in the name of love and forgiveness they began screwing these pieces of iron together a great many men when they commenced would say i recant i expect i would have been one of them i would have said now you just stop that i will admit anything on earth that you want i will admit there is one god or a million one hell or a billion suit yourselves but stop that but i want to say the thumbscrew having got out of the way i am going to have my say there was now and then some man who wouldn't turn judas iscariot to his own soul there was now and then a man willing to die for his conviction and if it were not for such men we would be savages to-night 
had it not been for a few brave and heroic souls in every age we would have been naked savages this moment with pictures of wild beasts tattooed upon our naked breasts dancing around a dried snake fetish and i to-night thank every good and noble man who stood up in the face of opposition and hatred and death for what he believed to be right and then they screwed this thumbscrew down as far as they could and threw him into some dungeon where in throbbing misery and the darkness of night he dreams of the damned but that was done in the name of universal love i saw there at the same time what they called the collar of torture imagine a circle of iron and on the inside of that more than a hundred points as sharp as needles this being fastened upon the throat the sufferer could not sit down he could not walk he could not stir without being punctured by those needles and in a little while the throat would begin to swell and finally suffocation would end the agonies of that man when maybe the only crime he had committed was to say with tears upon his sublime cheeks i do not believe that god the father of us all will damn to eternal punishment any of the children of men think of it and i saw there at the same time another instrument called the scavenger's daughter which resembles a pair of shears with handles where handles ought to be but at the points as well and just above the pivot that fastens the blades a circle of iron through which the hands would be placed into the lower circles the feet and into the center circle the head would be pushed and in that position he would be thrown prone upon the earth and kept there until the strain upon the muscles produced such agony that insanity and death would end his pain and that was done in the name of whosoever smiteth thee upon one cheek turn him the other also think of it and i saw also the rack with the windlass and chains upon which the sufferer was laid about his ankles were fastened chains and about his wrists also and then priests began turning this windlass and they kept turning until the ankles the shoulders and the wrists were all dislocated and the sufferer was wet with the sweat of agony and they had standing by a physician to feel his pulse what for to save his life yes what for in mercy no simply that they might preserve his life that they might rack him once again and this was done recollect it it was done in the name of civilization it was done in the name of law and order it was done in the name of morality it was done in the name of religion it was done in the name of god sometimes when i get to reading about it and when i get to thinking about it it seems to me that I have suffered all these horrors myself, as though I had stood upon the shore of exile, and gazed with a tear-filled eye toward home and native land, as though my nails had been torn from my hands, and into my throat the sharp needles had been thrust, as though my feet had been crushed in iron boots, as though I had been chained in the cells of the Inquisition, and had watched and waited in the interminable darkness to hear the words of release as though i had been taken from my fireside from my wife and children and taken to the public square chained and faggots had been piled around me as though the flames had played around my limbs and scorched the sight from my eyes as though my ashes had been scattered to the four winds by the hands of hatred as though I had stood upon the scaffold and felt the glittering axe fall upon me. And while I feel and see all this, I swear that while I live I will do what little I can to augment the liberty of man, woman, and child. My friends, it is all a question of sense it is all a question of honesty 
if there is a man in this house who is not willing to give to everybody else what he claims for himself he is just so much nearer to the barbarian than i am it is a simple question of honesty, and the man who is not willing to give to every other human being the same intellectual rights he claims himself is a rascal, and you know it. It is a simple question, I say, of intellectual development and of honesty, and I want to say it now so you will see it. You show me the narrow, contracted man. You show me the man who claims everything for himself and leaves nothing for others. And that man has got a distorted and deformed brain. That is the matter with him. He has no sense, not a bit. Let me show you. A little while ago I saw models of everything man has made for his use and for his convenience. I saw all the models of all the water craft, from the dugout in which floated a naked savage, one of our ancestors, a naked savage with teeth two inches long, with a spoonful of brains in the back of his head. I saw the water craft of the world, from that dugout up to a man of war that carries a hundred guns and miles of canvas, from that dugout to the steamship that turns its brave prow from the port of New York through three thousand miles of billows with a compass like a conscience that does not miss throb or beat of its mighty iron heart from one shore to the other. I saw at the same time the weapons that man has made from a rude club such as was grasped by that savage when he crawled from his den, from his hole in the ground, and hunted a snake for his dinner, from that club to the boomerang, to the sword, to the crossbow, to the blunderbuss, to the flintlock, to the caplock, to the needle gun, up to the cannon cast by Krupp capable of hurling a ball of two thousand pounds through eighteen inches of solid steel. I saw, too, the armor from the turtle shell that our ancestors lashed upon his skin when he went out to fight for his country to the skin of the porcupine with the quills all bristling, which he pulled over his orthodox head to defend himself from his enemies, I mean, of course, the orthodox head of that day, up to the shirts of mail that were worn in the Middle Ages, capable of resisting the edge of the sword and the point of the spear, up to the iron-clad, to the monitor completely clad in steel, capable only, a few years ago, of defying the navies of the globe. I saw at the same time the musical instruments, from the tom-tom, which is a hoop with a couple strings of rawhide drawn across it, from that tom-tom up to the instruments we have today, which make the common air blossom with melody. I saw, too, the paintings, from the daub of yellow mud up to the pieces which adorn the galleries of the world and the sculpture from the rude gods with six legs and half a dozen arms and the rows of ears up to the sculpture of now wherein the marble is clad with such loveliness that it seems almost a sacrilege to touch it and in addition i saw there ideas of books books written upon the skins of wild beasts books written upon shoulder blades of sheep books written upon leaves upon bark up to the splendid volumes that adorn the libraries of our time when i think of libraries i think of the remark of plato the house that has a library in it has a soul i saw there all these things and also the implements of agriculture from a crooked stick up to the plow which makes it possible for man to cultivate the soil without being an ignoramus I saw at the same time a row of skulls, from the lowest skull that has ever been found, skulls from the central portion of Africa, skulls from the Bushmen of Australia, up to the best skulls of the last generation. And I notice that there was the same difference between those skulls that there is between the products of those skulls. And I said to myself, it is all a question of intellectual development. It is a question of brain and sinew. I noticed that there was the same difference between those skulls that there was between that dugout and that man of war and that steamship. 
that skull was low it had not a forehead a quarter of an inch high but shortly after the skulls became doming and crowning and getting higher and grander that skull was a den in which crawled the base and meaner instincts of mankind and this skull was a temple in which dwelt joy liberty and love so said i this is all a question of brain and anything that tends to develop intellectually mankind is the gospel we want now i want to be honest with you honor bright nothing like it in the world no matter what i believe now let us be honest suppose a king if there was a king at the time this gentleman floated in the dugout and charmed his ears with the music of the tom-tom suppose the king at that time if there was one and the priest if there was one had said that dugout is the best boat that ever can be built the pattern of that came from on high, and any man who says he can improve it by putting a log or a stick in the bottom of it with a rag on the end is an infidel. Honor bright, what in your judgment would have been the effect upon the circumnavigation of the globe? That is the question. Suppose the king, if there was one, and the priest, if there was one, and I presume there was, because it was a very ignorant age. Suppose they had said, That tom-tom is the most miraculous instrument of music that any man can conceive of. That is the kind of music they have in heaven. An angel sitting upon the golden edge of a fleecy cloud, playing upon that tom-tom, became so enraptured, so entranced with her own music, that she dropped it. And that is how we got it, and any man that says that it can be improved by putting a back and a front to it, and four strings and a bridge on it, and getting some horsehair and resin, is no better than one of the weak and unregenerate. I ask you what effect would that have had upon music? I ask you, honor bright, if that course had been pursued, would the human ears ever have been enriched with the divine symphonies of Beethoven? That is the question. And suppose the king, if there was one, and the priest had said, That crooked stick is the best plow we can ever have invented. The pattern of that plow was given to a pious farmer in a holy dream, and that twisted straw is the ne plus ultra of all twisted things, and any man who says he can make an improvement, we will twist him. Honor bright, what, in your judgment, would have been the effect upon the agricultural world? Now you see, the people said, we want better weapons with which to kill our enemies. So the people said, we want better plows. The people said, we want better music. The people said, we want better paintings. And they said, whoever will give us better plows and better arms and better paintings and better music, we will give him honor. We will crown him with glory. We will robe him in the garments of wealth and every incentive has been held out to every human being to improve something in every direction. And that is the reason the club is a cannon. That is the reason the dugout is a steamship. That is the reason the daub is a painting. And that is the reason that that piece of stone has finally become a glorified statue. Now then, this fellow in the dugout had a religion. That fellow was orthodox. He had no doubt. He was settled in his mind. He did not wish to be insulted. He wanted the bark of his soul to lie at the wharf of orthodoxy and rot in the sun. He wanted to hear the sails of old opinions flap against the mast of old creeds. He wanted to see the joints in the sides open and gape as though thirsty for water. And he said, Now don't disturb my opinions. You'll get my mind unsettled. I have got it all made up, and I don't want to hear any infidelity either. As far as I am concerned, I want to be out on the high sea. I want to take my chance with wind and wave and star, and I had rather go down in the glory and grandeur of the storm than to rot at any orthodox wharf. 
of course i mean by orthodoxy all that don't agree with my doxy do you understand now this man had a religion that fellow believed in hell yes sir and he thought he would be happier in heaven if he could just lean over and see certain people that he disliked broiled that fellow has had a great many intellectual descendants it is an unhappy fact in nature that the ignorant multiply much faster than the intellectual this fellow believed in the devil and his devil had a cloven hoof many people think i have the same kind of footing he had a long tail armed with a fiery dart and he breathed brimstone and do you know there has not been a patentable improvement made on that devil for four thousand years that fellow believed that god was a tyrant that fellow believed that the earth was flat that fellow believed as i told you in a literal burning seething lake of fire and brimstone that is what he believed in that fellow too had his idea of politics and his idea was might makes right and it will take thousands of years before the world will believingly say right makes might now all i ask is the same privilege of improving on that gentleman's theology as upon his musical instrument the same right to improve upon his politics as upon his dugout that is all i ask for the human soul the same liberty in every direction and that is all that is the only crime that i have committed that is all i say let us have a chance let us think and let each one express his thoughts let us become investigators not followers not cringers and crawlers if there is in heaven an infinite being he never will be satisfied with the worship of cowards and hypocrites honest unbelief will be a perfume in heaven when hypocrisy no matter however religious it may be outwardly will be a stench that is my doctrine that is all there is to it give every other human being all the chance you claim for yourself to keep your mind open to the voices of nature to new ideas to new thoughts and to improve upon your doctrine whenever you can that is my doctrine do you know we are improving all the time do you know that the most orthodox people in this town today three hundred years ago would have been burned for heresy do you know some ministers who denounce me would have been in the inquisition themselves two hundred years ago do you know where once burned and blazed the bivouac fires of the army of progress the altars of the church glow today do you know that the church today occupies about the same ground that unbelievers did one hundred years ago do you know that while they have followed this army of progress protesting and denouncing they have had to keep within protesting and denouncing distance but they have followed it they have been the men let me say in the valley the men in the swamps shouting to and cursing the pioneers on the hills the men upon whose forehead was the light of the coming dawn the coming day but they have advanced in spite of themselves they have advanced if they had not i would not speak here to-night if they had not not a solitary one of you could have expressed your real and honest thought but we are advancing and we are beginning to hold all kinds of slavery in utter contempt do you know that and we are beginning to question wealth and power we are questioning all creeds and all dogmas we are not bowing down as we used to to a man simply because he is in the robe of a clergyman and we are not bowing down to a man now simply because he is a king no we are not bowing down simply because he is rich we used to worship the golden calves but we do not now the worst you can say of an american is he worships the gold of the calf not the calf and even the calves are beginning to see this distinction 
It no longer fills the ambition of a man to be emperor or king. The last Napoleon was not satisfied with being emperor of the French. He was not satisfied with having a circlet of gold about his head. He wanted some evidence that he had something within his head. So he wrote the life of Julius Caesar that he might become a member of the French Academy. Compare, for instance, in the German Empire, King William and Bismarck. King William is the one anointed of the Most High, as they claim, the one upon whose head has been poured the divine petroleum of authority. Compare him with Bismarck, who towers an intellectual colossus above this man. Go into England and compare George Eliot with Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria clothed in the garments given to her by blind fortune and by chance. George Eliot robed in garments of glory, woven in the loom of her own genius. Which does the world pay respect to? I tell you, we are advancing. The pulpit does not do all the thinking. The pews do it, nearly all of it. The world is advancing, and we question the authority of those men who simply say, It is so, down upon your knees and admit it. When I think of how much this world has suffered, I am amazed. When I think of how long our fathers were slaves, I am amazed. Why, just think of it. This world has only been fit for a gentleman to live in fifty years. No, it has not. It was not until the year 1808 that Great Britain abolished the slave trade. Up to that time her judge, sitting upon the bench in the name of justice, her priests occupying the pulpit in the name of universal love, owned stock in slave ships and luxuriated in the profits of piracy and murder. It was not until the year 1808 that the United States abolished the slave trade between this and other countries, but preserved it as between the states. It was not until the 28th day of August 1833 that Great Britain abolished human slavery in her colonies, and it was not until the first day of January 1863 that Abraham Lincoln wiped from our flag the stigma of disgrace. Abraham Lincoln, in my judgment the grandest man ever president of these United States, and upon whose monument these words could truthfully be written. Here lies the only man in the history of the world who, having been clothed with almost absolute power, never abused it except on the side of mercy. Think, I say, how long we clung to the institution of human slavery, how long lashes upon the naked back were the legal tender for labor performed. Think of it when the pulpit of this country deliberately and willfully changed the cross of Christ into the whipping post. Think of it, and tell me then if I am right when I say this world has only been fit for a gentleman to live in fifty years. I hate with every drop of my blood every form of tyranny. I hate every form of slavery. I hate dictation. I want something like liberty. And what do I mean by that? The right to do anything that does not interfere with the happiness of another physically. Liberty of thought includes the right to think right and the right to think wrong. Why? Because that is the means by which we arrive at the truth. For if we knew the truth before, we needn't think. Those men who mistake their ignorance for facts never do think. You may say to me, how far is it across this room? I say, one hundred feet. Suppose it is one o five. Have I committed any crime? I made the best guess I could. You ask me about anything, I examine it honestly, and when I get through, what should I tell you? What I think, or what you think? What should I do? There is a book put in my hands. They say, this is the Koran. It was written by inspiration. Read it. I read it. Chapter 7, entitled The Cow. Chapter 9, entitled The Bee, and so on. I read it. 
and when i get through with it suppose i think in my heart and in my brain i don't believe a word of it and you ask me what do you think of it now admitting that i live in turkey and have a chance to get an office what should i say now honor bright should i just make a clean breast of it and say upon my honor i don't believe it then is it right for you to say that fellow will steal that fellow is a dangerous man he is a robber now suppose i read the book called the bible and i read it honor bright and when i get through with it i make up my mind that book was written by men and along comes the preacher of my church and he says did you read that book i did do you think it is divinely inspired i say to myself now if i say it is not they will never send me to congress from this district on earth now honor bright what ought i to do ought i to say i have read it i have been honest about it don't believe it <laughs> now ought i to say that if that is a real transcript of my mind or ought i to commence hemming and hawing and pretend that i do believe it and go away with the respect of that man hating myself for a cringing coward now which for my part i would rather a man would tell me what he honestly thinks and he will preserve his manhood i had rather be a manly unbeliever than an unmanly believer i think i will stand higher at the judgment day if there is one and stand with as good a chance to get my case dismissed without costs as a man who sneaks through life pretending he believes what he does not i tell you one thing there is going to be one free fellow in this world i am going to say my say i tell you i am going to do it kindly i am going to do it distinctly but i am going to do it now if men have been slaves what about women women have been the slaves of slaves and that's a pretty hard position to occupy for life they have been the slaves of slaves and in my judgment it took millions of ages for women to come from the condition of abject slavery up to the institution of marriage let me say right here tonight i regard marriage as the holiest institution among men without the fireside there is no human advancement without the family relation there is no life worth living every good government is made up of good families the unit of government is family and anything that tends to destroy the family is perfectly devilish and infamous i believe in marriage and i hold in utter contempt the opinions of long-haired men and short-haired women who denounce the institution of marriage let me say right here and i have thought a good deal about it let me say right here the grandest ambition that any man can possibly have is to so live and so improve himself in heart and brain as to be worthy of the love of some splendid woman and the grandest ambition of any girl is to make herself worthy of the love and adoration of some magnificent man that is my idea and there is no success in life without it if you are the grand emperor of the world you had better be the grand emperor of one loving and tender heart and she the grand empress of yours the man who has really won the love of one good woman in this world i do not care if he dies in the ditch a beggar his life has been a success i say it took millions of years to come from the condition of abject slavery up to the condition of marriage ladies the ornaments you bear upon your person tonight are but the souvenirs of your mother's bondage the chains around your necks and the bracelets clasped upon your wrists by the thrilling hand of love have been changed by the wand of civilization from iron to shining glittering gold but nearly every religion has accounted for the devilment in this world by the crime of woman what a gallant thing that is and if it is true i had rather live with the woman i love in a world full of trouble than to live in heaven with nobody but men 
I say that nearly every religion has accounted for all the trouble in this world by the crime of woman. I read it in a book, and I will say now that I cannot give the exact language. My memory does not retain the words, but I can give the substance. I read in a book that the Supreme Being concluded to make a world and one man, that he took some nothing and made a world and one man and put this man in a garden, but he noticed that he got lonesome. He wandered around as if he was waiting for a train. There was nothing to interest him, no news, no papers, no politics, no policy, and as the devil had not yet made his appearance, there was no chance for reconciliation, not even for civil service reform. Well, he would wander about this garden in this condition until finally the supreme being made up his mind to make him a companion. And having used up all the nothing he originally took in making the world and one man, he had to take a part of the man to start a woman with. And so he caused a deep sleep to fall upon this man. Now understand me, I didn't say this story is true. After the sleep fell upon this man, he took a rib, or as the French would call it, a cutlet, out of this man, and from that he made a woman. And considering the raw material, I look upon it as the most successful job ever performed. Well, after he got the woman done, she was brought to the man, not to see how she liked him, but to see how he liked her. He liked her. And they started housekeeping, and they were told of certain things they might do, and one thing they could not do. And, of course, they did it. I would have done it in fifteen minutes, and I know it. There wouldn't have been an apple on that tree half an hour from date, and the limbs could have been full of clubs. And then they were turned out of the park, and an extra force was put on to keep them from getting back. Then devilment commenced. The mumps, and the measles, and the whooping cough, and the scarlet fever started in their race for man, and they began to have the toothache. The roses began to have thorns, and snakes began to have poison teeth, and people began to divide about religion and politics, and the world has been full of trouble from that day to this. Now nearly all of the religions of this world account for the existence of evil by such a story as that. I read in another book what appeared to be an account of the same transaction. It was written about four thousand years before the other, but all commentators agree that the one that was written last was the original, and that the one that was written first was copied from the one that was written last. But I would advise you all not to allow your creed to be disturbed by a little matter of four or five thousand years. In this other story, the Supreme Brahma made up his mind to make the world and man and woman. And he made the world, and he made the man, and he made the woman, and he put them on the island of Ceylon. And according to the account, it was the most beautiful island of which man can conceive. Such birds, such songs, such flowers, and such verdure. And the branches of the trees were so arranged that when the wind swept through them, every tree was a thousand aeolian harps. The supreme Brahma, when he put them there, said, Let them have a period of courtship, for it is my desire and will that true love should forever precede marriage. When I read that, it was so much more beautiful and lofty than the other that I said to myself, if either one of these stories ever turns out to be true, I hope it will be this one. Then they had their courtship, with the nightingales singing and the stars shining and the flowers blooming, and they fell in love. Imagine the courtship. No prospective fathers or mothers-in-law. No prying and gossiping neighbors. Nobody to say, Young man, how do you expect to support her? Nothing of that kind. They were married by the Supreme Brahma, and he said to them, Remain here. You must never leave this island. Well, after a little while, the man, and his name was Amend, and the woman's name was Heva, and the man said to Heva, I believe I'll look about a little. And he went to the northern extremity of the island, 
where there was a little narrow neck of land connecting it with the mainland and the devil who was always playing pranks with us got up a mirage and when he looked over to the mainland such hills and dells vales and dales such mountains crowned with silver such cataracts clad in robes of beauty did he see there that he went back and told Eva, the country over there is a thousand times better than this let us migrate she like every other woman that ever lived said let well enough alone we have all we want let us stay here but he said no let us go so she followed him and when they came to this narrow neck of land he took her on his back like a gentleman and carried her over but the moment they got over they heard a crash and looking back discovered that this narrow neck of land had fallen into the sea with the exception of now and then a rock and the mirage had disappeared and there was naught but rocks and sand and then a voice called out cursing them then it was the man spoke up and i have liked him ever since for it curse me but curse not her it was not her fault it was mine that's the kind of man to start a world with the supreme brahma said i will save her but not thee she spoke up out of her feelings of love out of a heart in which there was love enough to make all of her daughters rich in holy affection and said if thou wilt not spare him spare neither me i do not wish to live without him i love him then the supreme brahma said and i have liked him first rate ever since i read it i will spare you both and watch over you honor bright isn't that the better story and from that same book i want to show you what ideas some of these miserable heathen had the heathen we are trying to convert we send missionaries over yonder to convert heathen there and we send soldiers out on the plains to kill heathen there and if we can convert the heathen why not convert those nearest home why not convert those we can get at why not convert those who have the immense advantage of the example of the average pioneer but to show you the men we are trying to convert in this book it says man is strength woman is beauty man is courage woman is love when the one man loves the one woman and the one woman loves the one man the very angels leave heaven and come and sit in that house and sing for joy they are the men we are converting think of it I, I tell you when i read these things i begin to say love is not of any country nobility does not belong exclusively here and through all the ages there have been a few great and tender souls lifted far above their fellows now my friends it seems to me that the woman is the equal of the man she has all the rights i have and one more and that is the right to be protected that's my doctrine you are married try and make the woman you love happy try to make the man you love happy whoever marries simply for himself will make a mistake but whoever loves a woman so well that he says i will make her happy makes no mistake and so with the woman who says i will make him happy there is only one way to be happy and that is to make somebody else so and you can't be happy cross lots you have got to go to the regular turnpike road if there is any man i detest it is the man who thinks he is the head of the family the man who thinks he is boss that fellow in the dugout used that word boss that was one of his favorite expressions that he was boss imagine a young man and a young woman courting walking out in the moonlight and the nightingale singing a song of pain and love as though the thorn touched her heart imagine them stopping there in the moonlight and starlight and song and saying now here let's settle who's boss i tell you 
it is an infamous word and an infamous feeling a man who is boss who is going to govern his family and when he speaks let all the rest of them be still some mighty idea is about to be launched from his mouth <sighs> do you know i dislike this man unspeakably and a cross man i hate above all things what right has he to murder the sunshine of the day what right has he to assassinate the joy of life where you go home you ought to feel the light there is in the house if it is in the night it will burst out of doors and windows and illuminate the darkness it is just as well to go home a ray of sunshine as an old sour cross curmudgeon who thinks he is the head of the family wise men think their mighty brains have been in a turmoil they have been thinking about who will be alderman from the fifth ward they have been thinking about politics great and mighty questions have been engaging their minds they have bought calico at eight cents or six and want to sell it for seven think of the intellectual strain that must have been on a man and when he gets home everybody else in the house must look out for his comfort a woman who has only taken care of five or six children and one or two of them may be sick has been nursing them and singing to them and taking care of them and trying to make one yard of cloth do the work of two she of course is fresh and fine and ready to wait upon this great gentleman the head of the family i don't like him a bit end of part one of ingersoll's lecture on liberty of man, woman, and child. This will be concluded on the next file. Thank you for listening.